The Return of Normativity. I've entitled this, and to remind you of a big theme in this course, we've been talking a lot about two-level theories. Two-level theories according to which there's some fundamental level that's hidden from us, but that explains what's going on at the surface level. Now those theories, as we've noticed, tend to banish normativity, because they propose a bottom level that is either purely material or purely economic, or in some other way has nothing to do with norms, with right, wrong, should, good, bad, evil, etc. It's hard to fit all of those in. All of those look like surface level phenomena that have no real explanation at the level of pure causes and effects in material terms, or the bubblings of the subconscious mind in Freud, or what have you. Now, part of the thesis of the course has been that that's part of what makes possible the moral horrors of the 20th century. Once you banish norms, once you're convinced that if you have the hidden knowledge, then all this talk about what ought to be the case, or should be the case, or must not be the case, what's right or wrong, what is virtuous or vicious, all of that goes out the window, and you think of yourself as exempt from it. But now, there's partly here a really important philosophical question. How can we, we recover normativity? If we decide that it's a disaster to lose this sense of norms, then how can we recover that? But also, there's a historical question. When did people start recognizing the need for norms? Now, I think that started happening in the 1970s in a big way, in intellectual terms. John Rawls, in 1971, published his book, A Theory of Justice, a very thick book that really rescued normative ethics and political theory from decades of, of people denouncing it or ignoring it or thinking it was just a matter of expression of emotion. He gave a, he, he gave a theory that really tried to explain how we could talk about justice and injustice in rational terms. Robert Nozick followed that up with a very different perspective just three years later in his book, Anarchy, State, and Utopia. In 1975, uh, the Russia and Western countries signed the Helsinki Accords that established a moral foundation for human rights. Initially, a lot of people thought of that skeptically. Uh, many of the countries signing it didn't really respect those rights, but it did provide a moral foundation against which countries could be judged. And so in the longer term, actually did have a significant impact. <coughs> And then in 1979, Margaret Thatcher was elected Prime Minister of the UK, and a year later, Ronald Reagan was elected President of the US, and in both cases, they ran on platforms that were partly based on foreign policy, partly based on economics, but in large part, based on ethics, based on the idea of bringing norms back into public life. And so, really, both at the level of politics and at the level of theory, there was a resurgence of a concern for normativity, a concern for right and wrong, justice and injustice, morality and immorality, that began in the 1970s. Now, I want to talk some today about Rawls's theory. We're going to talk then next week about Nozick's theory. But before we get to the details of how it worked out in the real world, let's talk about it some in theory. The problem of distributive justice is the problem of how the goods, but also the responsibilities of a society, ought to be distributed among its members. There are certain goods that come with being in society, including material goods, but not limited to those. There are privileges, there are offices, there are positions. Um, there are all sorts of benefits that get distributed among members, but there are also responsibilities. People have to do things. People have jobs to fulfill. People have roles to play, sometimes very unpleasant ones, fighting in combat zones, for example. So the question is how those get distributed among the members. Now, keep in mind throughout this discussion, a point that Nozick reminds us of constantly, a lot of these arise in the context of particular people's lives and projects or particular human relationships. So they're not really detached. They're things that individual people make or responsibilities that individual people take on. And so it's not as if there's a big pool of responsibilities and also benefits and we just toss them out as if they're a bunch of cards in a deck and we're deciding who to deal to. A lot of these arise through people's actual activities. And so there are lots of people who actually make the goods, who undertake the responsibilities, and all that in the end should be relevant. So suppose we look at a pie chart like this, a lot of distributions. Here, Alex has a big share, John has a pretty big share, George next, Mike here, and William has the least. Is that fair or unfair? That's the kind of question that a theory of distributive justice tries to answer. Now notice if you just look at the pie chart, and I say, well, does that seem fair to you? It's sort of hard to answer that question, right? Here's a guy who's saying, <laughs> and why? What would you want to know about Alex, Mike, John, William, and George to answer the question of whether that's fair or unfair? Yeah? Never mind. Uh, the uh. compensation. Like, like if, she, if Alex is doing like X amount of work, is he getting paid or whatever is given to him? Is he getting 
relatively the, the more compared to everybody else. Okay, good. Yeah, we want to know what these people are doing, right? For example, Alex has the largest share. Well, how did that come about? It should matter whether Alex is getting it by, for example, robbing. Uh, well, John's pretty tough, so he doesn't rob him much, but he's constantly going over to William and saying, hey, William, I want your lunch money. Give it to me. Pow, 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 right? That's one way he could be getting more. Here's another way. Maybe it was all Alex's at the start, and he says, hey, John, you're a good buddy. Let me give you some. And William, you know, yeah, here's a piece too, and so on. And so if it all is Alex's to begin with, and he's given these, then it seems very different from if Alex is going around beating people up and, stay, and taking it. So in general, the question is, what do we need to know to know whether this is fair or unfair? Fair. What kinds of questions do we have to have answered? Yeah. I guess I just don't know how to accept that as the base in some ways because it seems to in a certain way assume that what these people have is kind of already there and then it's just arbitrarily distributed to them. But what they have is based on what they're doing to begin with. Like they're producing right. the goods which they have. So Good. Then, yeah, this is exactly Nozick's point. Exactly. So we have to realize... Hold on a second. Yeah, there's this chart maybe that indicates who has what, but we need to know how that came about, and in particular, um, who was making what's get, getting distributed here. If Alex made all of this and then gave some to his friends, you know, we'd say, well, wait, it, it's really my right all Alex's, and so nobody can complain that he still has most of it for himself. If, on the other hand, it all started as Williams, that everybody ganged up on him and whacked him over the head and took it, <laughs> then... That seems very different. So we do have to ask, presumably, all sorts of questions, not only about the distribution itself, but how it came about, uh, what these people are doing, what they've done in the past, and so on and so forth. And so the question really becomes, yeah, if you judge a distribution of this sort, what kinds of questions do you ask? Now, actually, the thought that you have to ask lots of historical questions, how did this come about, is Nozick's main point. Rawls, as we'll see, is trying to do it in terms of large-scale social institutions. I think history is not irrelevant to that, but it comes in only indirectly, as we'll see. And so it's going to be your... Anyway, keep that in mind, because as you see the details of the theory uh, that Rawls proposes, I think you're going to be more and more troubled that that part isn't really included very uh, explicitly at all. Now, what is Rawls really trying to do? Let's start with a very big picture. The 20th century has been, in part, the century of the growth of the welfare state, not only in the United States, but throughout Western Europe and in much of the developed world. The 30s in the U.S. really began all of this. In Bismarck's Germany, it began in the 1880s and 1890s. But in the U.S., it was really in the 1930s that we began to construct a welfare state. The 1960s expanded it greatly through the Great Society programs of LBJ. The role of government in that way changed, as we've seen, it went from protecting citizens from harm and providing a kind of framework for freedom to actually guaranteeing people's welfare. But now, there's a kind of complication to this. You might think, well, who's, who could be against that? Guaranteeing people's welfare. Good, right? Well, here's the thing. Guaranteeing one person's welfare restricts the freedom of others. Okay, so if some people need to be helped, that means the rest of us have to help them. And that may or may not be a large burden on us. And so there's a kind of limitation of freedom to the extent that we try to guarantee one person's welfare, we're imposing limits on the freedom of other people. Consequently, it becomes a legitimate question. How much is too much? How do we balance the needs of some people against the freedoms of others? And that is another way of looking at the problem, not only of the welfare state, but of distributive justice. To what extent is it legitimate to limit the freedom of some people in order to provide for the welfare of others? Now. Historically, we've examined various components of this. Here is FDR signing the bill that established the social security system. Um, here is LBJ signing the bill that established Medicare. But if that's true, if there was a tremendous change in government's role, and here you can see the change, uh, the level of federal spending as a percentage of GDP throughout most of American history it was down here below 5%, only rising when there were wars, like the Civil War here, for example, or here, World War I. But then you can see a trend that increases independently of wars. You see a huge spike for World War II, but otherwise a dramatic change, so the government is now around 25% of GDP. The federal government, that is, and in states and localities, and it's over 40%. And so the federal government has gone from something usually around about 2% of the economy, something that the ordinary person would never have interacted with, so something that people interact with all the time and actually plays a very large role in the economy and in 
life. So, what has justified that? Well, here you see a graph indicating entitlement spending. That is to say, really, spending on people's welfare, taking from some, giving to others for their benefit. And you see that it's really increased very, very dramatically. This indicates the increase in GDP in the economy itself, and that's the increase in entitlement programs. So it's been a very dramatic increase and a change in the conception of government's role. Well, we've looked at some of those graphs before. And so you can see how much this has grown um, over the years in per percentages of the federal budget. Defense has gone from about half to actually a rather small percentage. Social Security and Medicare has grown to more than a third of the budget. And in other anti-poverty programs, and you've got half the budget. So there has been a significant change. Oh, yes, and here's another way. On the White House website, it represents it this way. And so if this is sort of the total amount of federal spending, you can see this is national defense. This is Medicare, children's programs, Social Security. Here is welfare programs, so you can see a lot of this goes for precisely providing this kind of, uh, well, social programming. Um, this is, a, incidentally, education job training, so actually not only that whole green stripe, but much of this constitutes welfare spending. Now, the real question for us is, what justifies the welfare state? What's the argument for this? And Embarrassingly, by around 1970, people began to realize that, well, this has taken place, a tremendous change in government's role has been implemented, but there's really no theory behind this. There's no justification. That is to say, there's no way that people have said, here's precisely why we're doing this. And so the welfare state existed by 1970, but there wasn't really any theory. Now, Locke, Madison, Jefferson gave you a theory of the minimal state, or as it was developed by Henry Clay and others in the 19th century, including John Stuart Mill, providing the framework for liberty in a way that we've talked about before. On the other side, on the left of the political spectrum, you had Rousseau and Marx giving you a justification for socialism or communism. But the democratic welfare state, what was the justification for that? Where was its theory? There really wasn't one. And so that's the gap that John Rawls decided to try to fill in a series of papers starting in the 1950s, but culminating in his book, A Theory of Justice. So really, Rawls is supposed to go in there. But it's <coughs> remarkable that up to that point, there really wasn't anything. There wasn't anybody who told you why you should construct a welfare state of this kind without actually being a socialist or a communist or going on to a sort of very foreign perspective. So that's what Rawls tries to do. Now, I'll jump through some of that since we've already talked about that. Here's how he does it. He comes up with a conception of justice as fairness. Now, that sounds trivial. What is it to be just? Well, to be fair. Yes, but that doesn't seem to communicate anything. However, he puts some specific meaning on that. He says, look, what I mean by fairness is this. Suppose we're thinking of rules for a game. How could we construct a fair set of rules? Let's say we're making up this game, and we're trying to set things up fairly. Well, what would that mean? I don't know if any of you have tried to make up games. I used to do that. I used to make up board games when I was a little kid. Yeah? I guess you'd have to like allocate resources equally to everyone. I mean, I guess if you're starting off the beginning of a game, I don't know. But then again, we get to your pie chart thing where you don't know everyone's background and stuff, and it's crazy. But I guess if you're starting ah. a board game, though, you know, everyone gets the same amount of... Okay. Like, Standardly... Monopoly, you all get the same amount of money. Yeah. Good. Standardly, in a board game, everybody gets exactly the same amount at the beginning, right? Now, do they always? No. No. What are some board games you might imagine where you wouldn't start out with an equal amount of everything for everybody? Settlers of Catan. Settlers of Catan. Okay, good. I have a game called Class Struggle, a Marxist take on Monopoly, <laughs> where the capitalists start out with a lot and the proletarians have very little and so on and so forth. Um, and I should bring that in sometime and it would be amazing. Um, so there are, and if we actually, there are other games like Pandemic or my daughter has a new version where you don't play the doctors fighting the disease. You play the disease and you're trying to kill off humanity. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, when you say risk, you don't start out. Risk, exactly. Risk, you don't start out and it was exactly the same thing. Diplomacy. So, right, diplomacy. Good. So there are lots of games where you don't start this way. But how do you decide that the rules are fair despite that inequality? The ones that start with the least have other benefits. Good. The ones that start with least have other benefits. You might say, look, there's no built-in advantage. Right to being one side or the other side. If you devise a game and it's like, okay, we'll play my version of Monopoly where I start with 10 times what you start with, then it's like, wait, that's a crummy game, right? You always win. <laughs> 
And so here's his idea. It's fair if the rules are set up in such a way, roughly, that everybody has an equal chance of winning, that everybody would agree to those rules no matter what position they're playing in the game. So we could say principles of social justice are those that free, rational, self-interested, and equal persons would accept to govern their association, just as basically all the players would freely accept those rules as governing the game. They would say, well, no matter which position I'm starting in, I've got a chance. And so they would think that's fair. They would think that's acceptable. Now, it's important that they be free. If I hold a gun to your head and say, will you agree to the rules of my game? That's, that's not fair. What if you're ra irrational? I get you very drunk and agree to play Monopoly with you where I get 10 times what you have, right? That doesn't count. What if you're not self-interested? What if you're trying to lose, right? You feel bad for me. Uh, for some reason. You think, oh, that poor guy, he's a philosophy <laughs> professor, what a life, and so I'll let him win, <laughs> right? And that's not, that's not guaranteeing that this will be fair or equal. What if we come in and we say, yeah, well, I, I will set up this game. <laughs> I hope you will agree. Remember, I will be assigning you your grade. Uh, <laughs> you might say, no, no, no. So we have to start in a way that everybody's freely doing this. There's no coercion. They're doing it rationally. They're doing it with a concern for their own self-interest and they're equal parties. And the idea is if everybody accepts those rules as, a, as, as fair, then we'll count them as fair. Those are good principles of justice. Now, he's really setting this up in a way that is modeled on traditional social contract theory. It's something that occasionally in this course I've talked about right at the beginning. This term I didn't. So I'll have to go back and tell you a little bit about it. Social contract theory, as found in John Locke, or Jean-Jacques Rousseau, or Thomas Hobbes, or various other classic Enlightenment philosophers, is the view that government authority is legitimate because people would voluntarily choose to live under that authority. And if you think for a moment, government authority is really an awesome thing. And I don't mean awesome in the good way. I mean awe-inspiring thing. Um, government has the right to tax you and take your things. It has the right to imprison you. It has the right even to put you to death under certain circumstances. <coughs> what makes that a legitimate thing? What gives the government the right to do any of that? Well, the answer of the social contract theorist is, look, it's better than the alternative. <laughs> uh, you would agree to this. You would agree to, to be under these conditions. Why? Because think about what things would be like without government at all. That is, in these theories, called the state of nature. The state of nature is just defined as the state without any government authority. What would that be like? Now, people have given different answers to that question. What do you think that would be like? What if all government authority stopped? What if, let's say, the government goes bankrupt at every level? The city of Austin just says, we got no more money to pay policemen, firemen, and so on. City council members, they all just walk away. The same thing happens at the state level. The same thing happens at the federal level. What do you think that would be like? Yeah. I think people would gather and like, sort, you know, like it'd be like nomadic roaming people again, like back when there didn't used. To, I don't think it would be like total anarchy and cars burning in the streets and stuff necessarily. <clears throat> There's some okay. people would rob and stuff, but I think generally people would gather into groups and, you know, do their thing. Right. Okay, that's one possibility. People would gather into groups and protect themselves. That, in fact, is Locke's answer. That he thinks is what would happen. I think yeah. people would gather into groups and a few months later they'd starve because our entire distribution system just crashed. People, ah, people would gather into groups and then they would starve. Yeah, the more modern, the more complex a society is, the more vulnerable, in a sense, it is. Uh, you know, go back to the 17th century. All of a sudden, you can't get any food. Do you know how to farm? Probably, or you live close to people who do. But here in big cities, can we farm? I mean, I once tried to grow tomatoes. They were this big. <laughs> I have no soil in my lawn at all, basically. Nothing grows. Even weeds won't grow. <laughs> it's embarrassing, actually. People come to my house and they look and they say, I mean, don't have any self-respect. <laughs> but the answer is nothing will grow. It's, it's, I mean, it's this much dirt over sheer limestone. And so everything just burns up. There's, I, well, anyway, that's my own thing. But, but yes, I mean, suddenly I have to survive on my own without food distribution systems. What do I do? I mean, the most I could do is let algae grow in the swimming pool or <laughs> eat algae or something. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I'd be in deep, deep trouble, and most of us in cities would be. So what would happen then? Ugh. Yeah, nothing good. What are some other possibilities if government authority just ceased? Yeah. Um, assuming that humans kind of feel they need the government, and I agree, we probably make small groups, and then there's going to be that one or two people that realize there's no, nobody's going to stop me if I do something. And then 
You only need about one or two people to wreck everything. And in each group, there'll be those two people that just completely destroys it from the inside out. Ooh, okay, that's a real possibility. In fact, Thomas Hobbes says, this would be a war of all against all. You might think initially, oh, we'll band together and protect each other, but for, very, for just the reasons you've outlined, that's not gonna work. It will turn out that everybody figures out that, hey, if I gang up with these other people, I can take what you have, and so it's gonna be a war of every man against every man, he says, in which life will be solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. <laughs> so it could be sheer chaos and a war of all against all. It could be where we be band together in various groups. Other options. Yeah. Well, it's hard to conceive of how government would crash on such a substantial scale. But if it did, and we're still talking about our setting, I think people would still be looking for a source of authority. Mm -hmm. So even if the government is technically bankrupt, somebody's going to step in as a source of authority. I mean, it, it, I find it hard to believe that the people in government would even walk away. They have a very strong ethos that they are supposed to serve. So say the police might forward some kind of association. I don't know. Right. But okay. All right. Good. Some, something fills that. the vacuum. Yeah. Something will fill the vacuum. You want to say something? Well, if this is talking about an entire government system shutting down completely, then that means we lose things like police officers, firefighters, public libraries, prisons. That means that hundreds, thousands, millions in some instances, depending on different countries, would have prisoners just walking the streets. We're also talking about complete lack of various types of education. We're also talking about lack of medical control because some people are dependent upon the government for said medical instances. You're also talking about the lack of homes for individuals that need the government for things like that. The military wouldn't have anyone to answer to either. So I feel like this is just a recipe for a large disaster. Even if people were to band together, other bands would be larger and would most likely subdue them. I don't think this is something that you can simply define as being okay. Things would get bad and they'd get bad quickly. Ah, oh, okay. Things would get bad and they'd get bad quickly. Now, these are just the kinds of arguments that social contract theorists use to say, yeah, this would be really bad news. Guess what? We would choose to find to, something to fill the vacuum and recreate it. From. Why? Because we'd be in such danger. Either it would be a war of all against all, and there would be immediate danger, or there would be large numbers of people in great danger, or there would be some people seeking to take control and declare themselves a government, or we'd have these posses, these vigilante groups. There's a wonderful Simpson episode about this, um, about the Sp Springfield cat burglar, <laughs> where Homer becomes... Uh, the, the leader of one of these vigilante groups. And he starts doing all sorts of terrible things. You know, he's explaining at the dinner table one night, well, you know, I said to them, look, the car was upside down when we got there, and besides, your grandma shouldn't have <laughs> mouthed off like that. And Lisa says, Dad, if you're the police, who will police the police? Which becomes one of the main worries about this. And he said, I don't know, Coast Guard? <laughs> but it's a serious question, <laughs> right? We would want somebody to police the police, whoever declares themselves, because what's to keep them from being unjust in what they do? And so the argument goes, however you exactly characterize the state of nature, government's better than that. And so we would choose to live under government instead of face the state of nature without government. Now, what rules would you agree to? Well, that depends on what you think about the nature of this, right? If it's really a war of all against all, you're willing to give over a large amount of power to the government because you're in grave danger. If, like Locke, you think you're going to be basically protected by the vigilante group you're affiliated with, but there is this problem of injustice, then you're going to seek ways of limiting that and having impartial judgment, but you're willing to do that only in a limited way. So Locke says we give only a limited amount of power to the government. But however you think about that, your answer is going to be related to what you thought that state of nature really was. Yeah. Well, if you're assuming that everybody's like self-interested, which is how you have like th this huge chaotic state, right? It, it, even then, like it, it, unless they have like some way to coordinate against the government, wouldn't the government not necessarily have to be huge? You would just have to be able to impose a cost on somebody for stepping out of line that makes it not worth the risk. Exactly. So what government is going to have to do is have the power to punish and enforce the law. It will have to make laws. It will have to enforce laws, right? It will have to make judgments and punish. Hence Locke's idea that there will have to be a legislative, an executive, and a judicial function. It corresponds to those very things. Somebody's going to have to come up with laws. Someone will have to enforce them, and someone will have to make judgments under them. And so that's really a general idea, but then all the details of that matter hugely to what we end up saying about uh, yeah, which rules specifically do we decide on. Uh, it's in part going to depend on what we think the dangers here really are. Yeah. Uh, would there be the possibility that another country like China or Russia, who still has a running government, try to take over our um, 
United States. Ah, uh, that's true. I mean, we're thinking here of a state of nature where there's no government at all, but you're absolutely right. In fact, part of Rousseau's point... That's in the whole world, as that... The whole world. As, as in the whole world, yeah, exactly. But Rousseau it gives an argument like yours in a way, because he says, here's the danger. Initially, things might be great. In fact, he has this noble savage idea where I'm just there by the stream. And what am I eating? I'm just eating the apples that fall off the trees by the stream. And all my needs are satisfied. I get my cool water from the stream. There are other people by the stream, so I can discuss things with them and talk to them and seduce them and whatever happens. <laughs> it's all over. Anyway, my needs will all be fulfilled by the stream. But then what happens? Ooh, competition that gets more and more intense until finally the strong start oppressing the weak. And in the end, he says, a few are gorging themselves on luxuries while the multitude lack necessities. And so that's a version of yours without the necessity of government in there, though he does think governments will form and then be broken apart along the way. But the idea is, yeah, the strong will start realizing, hey, I can take the things of the weak. And so we'll get a situation where a few have a lot and they are oppressing really the rest. So he thinks, oh, initially things might actually look fine, but they won't stay fine. <laughs> the strong will take over, basically, and the weak are going to be... Is that, is that Locke or...? Um, that's Rousseau. Rousseau. Right. Yeah. Did you ever read the post or whatever, that book about how, like, civilization collapses, bombs go off, and there's... No? No. Oh, okay, because no. I was like, anyway, I was going to say, like, they have, like, lots of small towns that form up, because basically the people that have armaments, like guns and such like that, become right. powerful people, and you have right. small towns that form up around them, and then there's like roaming bands of nomads. Or did you read The Road? No, I don't read anything oh, okay. non-fiction. Because like, <laughs> yeah, there's like post-apocalyptic books, like where government's gone, and it yeah. kind of like relates to, there's like the whole anarchy view, where you just have like, everything's crazy and people are dead, and it's awful. Or like you have like small towns and civilizations and stuff. Right. Whatever. Well, that's true. I mean, small groups, basically, uh, you could say, here's what's going to happen. Small groups are going to form of people who know and trust each other. And then, what happens among those small groups? Rousseau's vision is the strong ones start beating up the weak ones. Locke's is, look, they more or less take care of themselves and it's okay, except when one group gets its hands on people from another group and makes judgments, and then it's going to be highly unreliable and highly unfair. That's, that's what I think, because so. people, people, I mean, especially nowadays, or, I mean, I don't know, people want to avoid conflict. I mean, even in a, even in an, you know, post-government um, society, we still, people don't want to go out of their way to go fight other people, to yeah. kill people. So, I mean, right. like, usually you protect yours and try to, like, do the best you can. And I guess if another group starts fooling you, then things get bad. But I think generally right. people wouldn't just be, like, you know, fighting each other all the time. Right. Even in that society. Yeah, you might think, in fact, there are ways of trying to actually test this. One way is to look at the Old West. When people f first settled a territory before there was any established government, they were precisely in a state of nature. If you were one of the first settlers in the Oregon territories or in Utah or wherever it was, uh, or in Texas for that matter, you were on your own. There was no government authority. And so what was life in the Old West like? Uh, for a long time, there was this image that, well, it was brutal and tough and there was a lot of violence and so on. But historians have looked into this and actually it was a pretty peaceful place. If you were a um, young male in your 20s and hung out in saloons, then you're likely out of dying <laughs> through a gunfight. Yeah, it was relatively high. But if you were not somebody who hung out in saloons under those circumstances, actually you were really safe. Why was the Wild West such an unwild and safe place? Partly because everybody had a gun. <laughs> okay, and so actually it was pretty dangerous to engage in a life of crime. And there were posses and vigilante groups and that kind of thing. And did they commit injustices? Yes. But actually, the level of violence was very low. And also, people, and, were, people were so focused on their own survival that it's difficult to... I mean, if you're, if you're yeah. busy just trying to live every day, it's really hard to have the energy to go cause trouble. And in a that's, really practical way of looking at it. Well, that, all right, that's a very good point. In the Wild West, there weren't many people... If you're a criminal, there aren't many potential victims around, and they're well armed. <laughs> okay, so it's a rather poor place to be a criminal. Contemporary Europe is a fantastic place to be a criminal. If you want to be a criminal, in fact, here's my advice to you. Move to Europe. <laughs> okay? Why? Because you can cross any border in the EU, but police jurisdictions end at the border. So property crime is through the roof, much higher than in even the worst parts of the United States, in most of Europe. Why? Because these gangs can come and cross borders. They will clean out Denmark and flee back to Poland, let's say. And but then by the time the Polish police get onto them, they're off into Hungary and so forth. And it's very easy to evade police because you can just get out of the jurisdictions really easily. In any event, so much who says philosophy isn't of any practical value. Now, here is 
Rawls' idea. Any social contract theory, however it characterizes the state of nature, however it wants to define government and its limits, has to specify, first of all, the ideal circumstances of choice. Faced with a state of nature, what would we choose? We're going to have to characterize what that choice is like. Then we're going to have to say, what are the principles of choice? How do we go about making that decision? And finally, what would you actually choose? So, as he analyzes it, there are three components to any theory of this form. We'll have to characterize the circumstances, describe that state of nature, describe the choice. Then tell us how we make that choice. Are we concerned with our own self-interest, our safety? What's at stake here? And then how would we actually choose? What would be chosen? What authority would we grant to government? And also what rules would we choose more broadly to govern our association? Now, what he tries to do is specify each of those. But in itself, this, I think, is a great achievement. You can see Hobbes, Locke, Rousseau, and other social contract theorists as answering precisely these questions and giving, giving you different answers to each of those issues. Well, Rawls now gives his own, but it's very much in that tradition. So he's trying to do the kind of thing that Locke and Hobbes and Rousseau were doing, but he, he's giving his own specific answer. Let's move to the first part, that circumstance of choice. He describes that as the original position. He says, there are two things that are going to have to characterize us in the original position. First of all, knowledge. We're going to have to know what we're doing. We're going to have to know all the relevant facts of politics, economics, sociology, psychology, and so on. We'll have to know what we're doing. After all, it would, otherwise it's like setting up the rules of a game, but not actually understanding what dice are, <laughs> or understanding what's going to be on the cards that people draw, and so on. We've got to understand how it works. And so, <coughs> This is an ideal situation, after all. We're imagining, well, ideally, we'd know everything about these things. We'd know how to set up a society to get the effects we want. But, he says, I want this to be fair. So I'm going to impose a constraint of the veil of ignorance. What that means is that although you should know all sorts of general relevant facts, you should not know your own place in society. You're one of the people making up the game. But when we start playing the game, you're going to actually get assigned one of these roles. right? You'll be the doctor or the nurse, or the disease, or whatever it is. You'll be the capitalist, or the proletarian, or something. You'll get assigned a role, but we want the game to work no matter which role you're assigned. So the idea is, you don't know what your own place in society is. You don't know what your role is going to be. You don't know your own natural abilities even, your propensities, your conception of the good. Because if you do, you can start biasing things in your direction. I could say, well, I'm a philosopher, so I would set things up so philosophers would be king. Ah! That's Plato's idea. But I could say, well, yeah, no, no don't, don't start out assuming you're a philosopher, right? No, the idea, just as in the game, you don't want to say, aha, I'm going to be the doctor or whatever. No, no, you don't know which role you're going to play. You don't know what your particular stance is going to be. So we've got to do this so it's fair no matter what starting point you have. The idea here is this idea of fairness. Everybody's equal, and no contingencies affect the choice. The fact that you happen to like baseball is not going to be relevant here. The fact that you know that you're a philosopher, or that you're a very good artist or something, no, that's, that's not allowed to take part in this. We know the general stuff, but we know nothing about our own condition and how we'll fit in. So it's like nobody can be like the king or something? Like nobody can be in command or no? Well, he doesn't want you biasing it in all sorts of ways. So, for example, um, yeah, here's a moral dilemma I actually faced. At one point, Austin voted on whether to subsidize the construction of a baseball stadium. And I thought, whoa, how do I vote on this? As a matter of principle, I oppose such subsidies. I don't think the government should be in the business of subsidizing baseball. Baseball fans should pay for it. On the other hand, I thought, but I love baseball. <laughs> and I'd rather have somebody else pay for my baseball than... Uh, and so my wife said, look, everybody else you know, votes to subsidize what they like. Go ahead and vote to subsidize what you like. But as I remember, I thought, as a matter of principle, no. I mean, baseball fans should play for, pay for, play for baseball. Opera fans should, play, should pay for opera, et cetera, et cetera. And so uh, I think I voted no. Maybe I was <laughs> well and voted yes. <laughs> but in any case, the idea is contingencies like that aren't supposed to matter. So it's not just that I can't say, ah, oh, Wait, if there's a king, will I be king? Uh, although that would certainly be ruling it out. I shouldn't even know the things I like and dislike. Like, maybe I really dislike seafood. So I say, yeah, there will be a very high tax on seafood. <laughs> uh, no, that, that, look, that's not fair. I've got to assume nothing about my own natural abilities or tastes or preferences. So it's not just there won't be a king. 
Certainly there won't be, but also I, th there's not going to be a built-in bias in favor of any particular conception of the right way to live. That's his idea. Yeah. Um, I thought a lot of these philosophies that we've been doing and a lot of the uh, social contracts were kind of like you, it's a lot of self-interest. Like the only reason these things right. work is because it's you, the, you have your ideal stuff where everybody's fair, equal, you're not putting a gun to anybody's head, and everybody's acting in self-interest. Right. But if we're not acting in self-interest, then why does this still kind of work? Oh, ah, all right, good question. Um, I'm supposed to be self-interested, but I don't know anything about myself. Okay, so many critics of Rawls have said, that's kind of a problem. How do I go about making a decision? Because I think, yeah, what would you choose, given that you know nothing about yourself or what you like? It's like, wait a minute. That's like saying, let's uh, tell you what, I'll order breakfast the day of the final exam. What would you like? But tell me what you would like if you didn't know anything about your own tastes and preferences. <laughs> it's like, well, how do I do that? Right? By the way, well, I'm willing to do that. If you all, would, yeah, if you all want donuts or breakfast tacos or whatever, let me know and I'll bring them in. Donuts. 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 Yeah. <laughs> I should set this up as this. <laughs> right, no. I mean, that's the point of the objection. You can say, wait, I don't know my. I, I don't know whether I like donuts, and I have to decide whether or not we should get donuts. How's that work, right? You choose something that is like healthier for you, or you don't even know that. You don't even know that, right? Now, and you know general things, so you know in general what's healthy for people, but you don't know what you like, or your own particular conception. So if it's a general thing, um, <laughs> you could know in general that donuts are bad for people and that eggs are better, but you couldn't know whether you, or not you're allergic to eggs. <laughs> yeah. Well, you choose what's fair to the average person because that gives you the best chance, even if you're self-interested, of being satisfied in that society. Exactly. Ooh, now that's one way to do this. You say, look, given that I don't know anything about my own position, here's what I do. I try to maximize the welfare of the average person in this society. Now that is exactly what a utilitarian would say, okay? That's what John Stuart Mill would say. And that supports this general framework of liberty idea. We could say, yeah, here's the general idea. I want to make the average person in my society as well off as possible. Rawls spends much of his book arguing against that. Now I agree, that's the obvious thing to say, right? And so he has a burden because he has to say, no, 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 I don't mean that. I'm going to get to a different conclusion. but. At this point, you can see how, wait, once everything unique to me is gone, what can I do except try to make the average person as well off as possible? Um, I don't know anything about my own tastes and natural abilities and place in society, but I'll try to make the average as well off as possible. He's going to say, no, you wouldn't. Not if you think about it carefully. Yeah. Well, couldn't you just think of all of the different scenarios, different people in different societies? I mean, that would take an incredibly long time, but if you're trying to think about, even if this is from a utilitarian standpoint, that would still benefit right. the most people if you're thinking about what would help different people in different positions, different social classes, right. different physical capabilities, because if we did just what was best for the average person, I mean, the average person doesn't necessarily always represent the people that are necessarily in need as much. Right. Ah, okay, good. Yes, that's the kind of concern that Rawls has, and it's why he thinks we wouldn't, in fact, choose on the basis of the average. So, suppose... <laughs> Suppose I bring you all in the original position now, the following proposal. How about we enslave some people? Now, not that many, only 10%, let's say, will be slaves, but we'll make them work for the rest of us really hard, and the rest of us will benefit. The average person will be better off. Now, it will suck to be a slave, <laughs> but the other 90% will be better off. So the average person will be better off, so what do you say? Make it 5%. <laughs> <laughs> he, yeah, he's negotiating for the percentage, but, <laughs> but you might say, wait, no, what if I'm a slave, right? Yeah, or I know. say, like an Athenian, and this really did happen in Athenian democracy, here's why the, how the average Athenian could be better off. What if we attack some weak city-states and take them over and exact tribute? Okay, so let's be imperialists. Let's march and have colonies and enslave those colonies. Well, again, you might say, um, wait, what if I'm one of the people who gets attacked? I don't know whether I'm going to be in Athens or not, right? I don't know my position, so hold on a second. I don't like that. But you shouldn't do it just because you might be one of the people enslaved. If this is just talking about justice, you shouldn't do it because you know it's not right. Oh, ah, okay, right. If we start with a conception of justice, we'd say, here's what's wrong with that. It's not right. Rawls is trying to build his conception of justice 
out of self-interest. And so that's a little bit weird, right? He's trying to say, no, 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 don't start with your idea that that's unfair. I'm going to tell you why, even purely self-interestedly, you would not play a game that had that rule. It's because you might end up being a slave under that game. So you might say, I don't need your theory, Rawls, because I already have a theory of justice, and I'm telling you slavery would be unfair, and that's why I oppose it. In that case, he's real, but his worry is, well, what if somebody else has some other theory? And so he says, I'm trying to explain how we could construct this in such a way that we can all consent. That means everybody's going to have to benefit. Everybody's going to at least potentially benefit. They're going to see how it's to their advantage to enter into the arrangement, even if they don't start out agreeing with you about justice. So from one point of view, he's going to say, that's fine, as long as we all agree on that theory. But I'm trying to do something even bigger. I'm trying to say, even if you don't start out agreeing with my theory, here's why I think in the end you'd, you'd end up choosing it. Um, so he's trying to start with self-interest and actually get justice out of it. Now, my colleague Tom Sung refers to that as pulling a rabbit out of a hat. And he says, look, here's the problem with that. The rabbit's already got to be in the hat. <laughs> and so one criticism of Rawls is just to say, you're getting justice out of this idea of self-interest, then somehow you're smuggling this idea of justice into that self-interest in the very beginning. And of course here, to some extent he's doing that. That's what he, why he calls it justice is fairness. We start with this idea of a fair choice. And then he thinks, that's all I need. I don't need the whole rabbit. I just need the, yes. the embryo of the rabbit or something. I don't know. This yeah. metaphor is going, going south on me. Anyway, we do want to ensure that everyone cooperates, not just those that agree with us or share some interests with us. And his idea is we test these principles against our intuitions, adjust one, adjust the other, try to come to some general agreement. And so he thinks if we do this, we will end up agreeing on two principles of justice. And here's the first one. Each person is to have an equal right to the most extensive basic liberty, compatible with a similar li liberty for others. He's getting this idea from Hobbes, who says, how much liberty would I give up to Leviathan, to the state? Well, only as much as I'm willing to have. I will retain, I'll give up everything, really, except what I'm willing to allow others to exercise against myself. And so Rawls is saying, yes, maximal equal liberties, at least with these basic liberties, the, those liberties of citizenship, political activity, speech, thought, property, the rule of law, the things that involve the rules of the game. I'm not <coughs> going to give up my right to affect the rules. After all, the rules can change. It's not like we decided them once and for all. And so the most important thing is I want to continue to be able to play a role in deciding what the rules are. If we're going to change them, I want to be involved in that change. But the second principle, which is subsidiary too, so the first thing is we must not violate those basic rights and liberties. But the second thing, really on the question of distributive justice, social and economic inequalities must be arranged so that they are reasonably expected to be to everyone's advantage, because everyone has to agree to this contract, and attached to positions and offices open to all. These are referred to as the difference principle and the equal opportunity principle. Equal opportunity in that, look, everybody's got a chance to play all the roles. Think again of the game. Maybe somebody at the beginning of the game is the capitalist and somebody's the proletarian. Maybe somebody's the doctor, somebody's the nurse, somebody is the disease and so on. We've got to set things up so that, you know, in principle, you could end up playing any of those roles in the game. But also, we want to set things up so that everybody could reasonably think that they can expect to benefit from the arrangement. Now, what would make me willing to tolerate an inequality in this society. <laughs> Is there anything? He says, well, sure. Look, if I'm harmed by this inequality, and I'm thinking in terms of self-interest, then no, I'm, I'm going to say no to it, right? <laughs> if it's an inequality that hurts me, then I'm going to reject it. But if it doesn't hurt me, I won't object to it. So he starts out with this definition. An injustice is just an inequality that is not to the benefit of all. Is there anything wrong with A having more than B? Well, nothing. No, if, as long as it doesn't harm B. So the idea becomes this. Sometimes an inequality hurts the person who is on the losing end of the inequality. Let's say A takes from B and so has more. Then B has suffered as a result of that. But if A has more for reasons that have nothing to do with disadvantaging B or harming B, then there's nothing wrong with this. So he says, imagine an equal distribution. What could make me willing to tolerate an inequality? Well, a benefit to me, right? Or at least a potential benefit to me. So the idea really becomes this. Uh, 
more precisely, I think you could say, an injustice <laughs> doesn't result at all from inequality uh, by itself. There's nothing wrong with inequality per se. If A has more than B, that's okay as long as B isn't worse off, as long as B isn't harmed. So, an injustice, when we go to the large scale, really ends up being an inequality that harms the least advantaged members of society. So Rawls says, here's how you judge the justice of a society. Look at its least advantaged members. Look at the people worst off. You want to make them as well off as possible. Okay? As long as an inequality benefits them. Let's say somebody gets rich, and in doing that, they build a company and they create jobs that helps other people, then great. It's, there's nothing wrong with that person being rich. It, in fact, helps other people below them. And so that's a good inequality. But there could be inequalities that actually make the low, lower party worse off. Those are the bad ones. Now, I think I'll conclude here, but I just want to point out the difference between two ideas that are often conflated. What Rawls is doing is giving you a philosophy of liberalism. Liberalism in the John F. Kennedy, LBJ sense, okay? Where the idea is to support those at the bottom and make them better off. Could be a great concern for their welfare. But there's nothing wrong on this view with inequality per se. The rich can get as rich as they want. That, in fact, typically benefits people, and so there's nothing wrong with the rich getting rich. What's wrong is the poor and their welfare, and that has to be improved. That's very different from the progressive that tends to say, no, 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 inequality is what bothers me. I don't like those people being so rich. At one point, Rousseau says, tolerate neither rich men nor beggars. And there he's explaining that progressive idea. It's not just the beggars you should be worried about. You should also knock down the rich. Whereas Rawls says, no, no, no. <laughs> What I'm worried about is the people at the bottom. I don't care how rich the people at the top get. In fact, their wealth tends to benefit everyone. Okay, next time we'll look at how this actually plays out historically and we'll look at Nozick's alternative view.